very welcome to what is the sixth uh, meeting of the, the Seat of BIM series. Um, this morning's topic is addressing the education, upskilling and tooling requirements for BIM. Most of you will know who I am. My name is Alan Hoare. I'm an academic, first and foremost, in the Dublin Institute of Technology. And I also have a particular interest in ICT and um, I was involved in setting up this network uh, over 10 years ago. Um, our event sponsor today is the Dublin Institute of Technology, uh, a partner in many respects with the Alliance. Um, we were very privileged and, and thankful to DIT for accrediting our Masters in Construction Informatics, which is accredited both at, on a full-time and a part-time basis uh, and it runs on a distance learning basis with students uh, right across Europe actually and indeed academics right across Europe teaching, teaching on the program. Many of our students on the program are actually here today and potentially some future students I can see are in the room as well and maybe more future students after this morning. Um, the Seat of BIM series is, is gaining a fantastic momentum uh, here in Ireland and indeed internationally. Um, we're right up there in the Google Analytics in regard to BIM. If you put BIM into, the, into Google, see there are probably four or five uh, uh, you know, on, the, on the hit list. Um, we've also got quite a lot of activity online, and, uh, which, is, uh, which, is, which, is, which is fantastic. Up to now, we've looked at issues like setting government policy for BIM, cultural change management in BIM, use of BIM by contractors and specialist contractors, the importance of BIM libraries and BIM standards and protocols. And today we're focusing on education. Um, this week uh, was an important week for the Chartered Institute of Building. They're here this week celebrating 50 years in Ireland. And I was privileged enough to speak at their Global BIM conference on Monday. And, uh, you know, every time I go to events like this, I, I, I learn more and more about this particular, this particular technology. And, you know, there was talk about our Darwinian time, the most transformational time since the Industrial Revolution. You know, a game changer. Um, you know, I'm starting to believe that myself, to, in some extent. There is something very special happening in this industry and a, a real change in mindset is needed in order to, to bring the industry forward. Um, you see by the program today, we have um, a number of speakers. Our keynote speaker this morning is Professor David Greenwood from University of Northumbria. David is also the, I believe is the acting dean of research and professor of construction management in the university. He's also co-founder of the BIM Academy, and indeed I met his, the other co-founder on Monday um, as well, and uh, Stephen Lockley, and uh, also director of Sustainable Cities Research Institute. He's won over 100 publications internationally. He's, a, he's been involved as an external examiner in over 30 uh, universities, both in the UK and overseas, and he's supervised in excess of 20 high-level research um, thesis. Um, so before we start, just to, to also uh, refer to the, the three other important speakers this morning uh, are, there, are our sponsors and our vendors. If you look at the title of this morning, um, a lot of people have talked about process and people, but technology is a very important aspect of BIM implementation. Um, and so we have three I suppose, technologists to speak this morning. What we're going to do is we're going to move the workshop forward. So at the very end of David's talk, he's going to leave three questions on his final slide, and we're going to discuss uh, around those three issues. Uh, and then we're going to move into the vendor phase um, and uh, I'll move it from there. Um, I suppose my message to the vendors as well this morning, as, a, as an educationist as well, we don't have any money. Uh, as educationists, at least not as much as we had. And I would hope that the vendors would start to work closer with the education institutes to provide not only free software to students, but also potentially free software 
to the colleges as well. Okay, so I think we'll start with David. David, you're very welcome. And thank you for agreeing to come over to talk to us. And we're all looking forward to hearing what you have to say about developments in Northumbria. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alan. And thanks for inviting me. And uh, it's, it's great to get such a, a good turnout. I'll move around so that I'm not give, getting too much. Uh, is it the other microphone? So. Okay, where are we? Yeah. Yeah, as I say, it's, uh, it's great to, to get such a good turnout. Um, the last talk I gave, I've actually just come via pick up a clean shirt, etc., from home when I was in London the other night and uh, doing a, a similar sort of talk. But I, d I don't know what went wrong, but there was only one person in the audience. So uh, I, I turned up on the stage, big hall, and the one person in the audience, I said, well, you know, we're wasting our time here, you better. He said, no, 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 carry on, carry on. So I, so I gave my talk, went through all my notes, and he was very patient. And I came to the end and packed them all up, and I said, well, that, that's great. You know, it'd be really good. You've sat through it all and everything. Um, I'll go now. He said, no, please don't go. I'm the next speaker. But uh, <laughs> So... Uh, Got, got you participating anyway. Um, what I want to do first is a bit of a, a bit of a plug for Northumbria. It's not really just to tell you where where we're, we're from. Um, the uh, within Northumbria currently is probably going to change next week whilst I'm away. But we're currently in eight schools, and the school that I'm involved with is built in natural environment. Uh, you'll understand built environment, but the natural bit comes because. We've uh, taken in, poor souls, uh, some geographers, uh, etc. within the school. So we've got the two. Um, you can read uh, as well as I can. I will, I'll not read all, all that off. But I, I, I have done talks overseas, and um, our PR from the centre, as it were, from the University of Northumbria, goes something like this. We are a large university. Well, when I delivered that in Cairo, when Cairo University has 500,000 registered students, I felt, a bit, uh, I felt a bit reluctant to do that. So I wouldn't describe us as large. We're, on UK terms, we're, we're fairly large, and the school's about a medium-sized school within that university. In terms of um, what I'm um, involved with, I'm the Associate Dean for Research, and from next month, I'm the Acting Dean of the school. Um, not for long, I'm sure, because I'll probably make a mess of it. But in terms of the research we do, what I've put on the right-hand side there is the usual uh, disciplines that you're all familiar with. Um, incidentally, as Alan said, um, this is directed at education primarily, but I'll, I'll try and make it a bit, a bit more interesting for the... I know we're all in, really interested in education, but for practitioners, I'll try and throw in some things that might interest you. Those are all the disciplines that you'd expect. <clears throat> and we tend to uh, do re research that, that fits those um, within the school. So, for example, you know, the conservators will be into this sort of area, uh, the services engineers probably this one, um, the geographers now, and some of the architectural people will be there and there and so forth. But it's, 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 it's a mixture, and we allow people to sit within these research groups. I would guess about... Uh, 40 to 50 percent of our of our academic staff are research active. Um, I'll put this up because this is one of our pride and joys. It, it, it's really uh, um, a first, I think. Uh, certainly a first in the UK. We got we got a project called Virtual Newcastle Gateshead. Um, you'll have heard of both places, but basically Gateshead sits at the south of the river and at Newcastle at the north of the river. Newcastle is the sort of famous bigger brother. Gateshead are the ones that get things done. So the, all of the beautiful buildings that have been happening around the river really are on the Gateshead side, and they're, they're a lot easier to work with. There's nobody from Newcastle City Council here, I hope. Not Newcastle, UK, anyway. Uh, so, um, but never mind. They're kind of coming together... Uh, and what we've done, we've gone into partnership with them and created a virtual model of the city. Uh, it's not the only city model, of course, but it's, I think it's the only one where you've got an academic establishment hosting it 
and what it's become as the de facto planning model for Newcastle and Gateshead planners and developers. The trouble is currently, you know, we know about the recession, there isn't much planning and development going on. Well, plenty of planning, but not much development. Uh, so we're kind of sitting there with this really, really good model. No, we do use it. The reason I introduced that is that this was our, our first kind of inroads into BIM. Um, at the time, I really didn't understand the difference between uh, 3D models or whatever D models and, and what BIM is. But um, I was <coughs> disabused of that position when uh, the, the guy that um, Alan mentioned, Professor Steve Lockley, colleague and good friend, uh, joined us at the university having spent two years sitting in his bedroom writing code for BIM. Previous to that, he'd worked for National Building Specification, and previous to that, he'd been a professor at Newcastle University. That's enough about Steve, I don't want to talk about him. Let's talk a bit more about me. Um, so what we've done is formed this organization called BIM Academy. And I'll, uh, that's, our, that's basically a, a, a screenshot of our web page. These are the people involved. You see, I've got a policy of trying to employ um, attractive women and ugly men. Um, and this is what we're trying to do with uh, BIM Academy. Um, the aims, and I've kind of truncated those to fit on the slide, advise, educate, research, talk about that in a minute, uh, promote collaborative working, all nice words, uh, be independent and impartial, um, and that's particularly important. I think we've, we've steered a, a really good, good course with the competing, sometimes aggressive competing software vendors. And what we've managed to do is work in harmony with, with, with all of them. And the last one provides some sort of evidence-based um, improvement. And the services we offer are consultancy, research, development, and education. What I'm going to do is to go into that a little bit more detail to tell you about BIM Academy. And then in the second part of the show, as it were, I'll, I'll make some pronouncements of what I think about education in BIM, um, at least from a UK perspective. And, and hopefully you can you know, draw some parallels from that and, uh, and, and, and perhaps uh, give me some advice. Um, the website is that, um, and it doesn't have to be uppercase, lowercase, or anything like that. That's the website. If you go in there, you'll get in here and it will tell you all there is to know, not about BIM, but about BIM Academy. Um, it's kept up to date pretty well, so the things we're doing in June, July, August, uh, events like this, including this one, will be, up, will be on there. Um, I'll say a bit about the people. Uh, th that's me, I didn't quite Photoshop it enough, but you vaguely recognize me. Um, this is Peter Barker, who's our operations, operations director, and this is Steve Lockley, who I've mentioned before. And we, we, we kind of run the show with another guy who doesn't want to be, uh, he, he, he doesn't want his image up there for, you know, perhaps doesn't want people to recognize him, I don't know. No, I know why. The reason being, um, this kind of fell into our lap serendipitously. It, it's a joint venture between ourselves, Northumbria University, and Rider Architecture. Rider are locally, in our region, pretty big. Um, they're the, one of the biggest architecture firms in our region. They do work up and down the UK, and they do international work as well. They're not enormous, but what they are is an early BIM adopter in terms of design. They've been working in BIM for, well, last 10 years really, but they really, at the last seven years, they've been really uh, committed uh, to basically Revit type of uh, design software. So because the managing director of Rider is a, an old friend of mine, we, we, we got together and we formed this kind of, uh, we, we formed this BIM Academy out of it. Now, we've got other people knocking on the door. We've got various affiliates and so forth, and you'll see them on the website. And we're also in, in discussions with, um, uh, with other organizations about actually coming into BIM Academy. I think we've hit the time just about right, and it, it, it's kind of, it's been a runaway success, I've got to say, in terms of interest. Maybe, uh, maybe also in terms of what we're doing, but that's uh, fingers crossed. The... 
individuals down there are a mixture of uh, graduates who've joined BIM Academy. We have a small sort of task force of people working on BIM models and other things, and I'm going to tell you about some of the other things in a minute, and uh, of lecturers uh, within uh, School of the Built Environment and people seconded to us from Rider uh, Architecture. Now later, in, in, in the sort of discussion sessions, I could tell you maybe a bit more about the governance, if you like, of BIM Academy. It's quite difficult uh, because we're working within university uh, procurement and, uh, and financial frameworks, which gives me a big headache. Uh, but we're working with people who are used to being, having to be flexible and working in, 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 in an industrial context. So it's quite a difficult act to, to, to pull off in that sense. But we, we're doing it and uh, we're doing really, as I say, quite well in, in most of these areas. So consultancy. Well, what I've done is I've selected an example of what we're doing in, in each of those areas, consultancy, research, and education. Um, in consultancy, probably our biggest um, project is to create with NBS, which is National Building Specification in the UK. You may, you may have heard of it, but basically they started with paper-based specifications and so forth. They went on to make it CAD-enabled so you can pull, pull objects into models, and now it's going, it's going BIM. So uh, we're working with them to create standards uh, and to enable designers, basically, as, as these diagrams show, to, to pull models into uh, the bigger BIM, to pull um, uh, units into the bigger BIM, BIM model when they're creating um, individual project models. So we're working with that. We're also working with individual manufacturers to, to, to BIM up their particular uh, details, and um, they work with MBS as well. Uh, the other type of consultancy we do is to actually send in people into projects to roll out uh, BIM ways of working within those projects. We're doing two or three of those, some of them quite large. In terms of a research, um, Again, I don't know if you know, the UK, a lot of the research in construction now in the UK is, is put through the Technology Strategy Board, which is ideal for us. As, as a university, Northumbria is, is probably more geared to this sort of research than anything else. It has to be industry-led. We can't need it. We can kind of coax people into putting in for these bids, but we've done several of them. And I really like them because they are very, very focused on immediate problems. Uh, and it kind of suits the, t the type of academics that we've got, rather than the more blue skies research that other big universities, Salford, Reading, Loughborough in the UK, uh, are, are adept at and better than us at. Um, certainly better than, uh, better than us at winning. But technology strategy board projects, uh, we, we really, that's our fishing pond. And there's a few of them. The latest one, which I commend you to have a look at, is called ISIM. Uh, and it's, there it is, what it says on the tin, interoperable carbon information modeling. And it's using BIM technologies uh, with a few other things to enable designers to model the carbon, both in terms of embodied and, and whole life carbon, in a design as it progresses. So just, I don't know whether I've got this on the slide, but no, I haven't. But So if we concentrate on just this diagram here, this is a, a typical kind of deck certificate uh, design where red is bad and green is good and you're going up there towards the green and that's what you're trying to aim at to have a, you know, your, your, your sort of carbon or whatever it is. So we're aiming at green. Now what this does, this allows designers to load in more and more detail as design progresses. So, okay, you, let's say you've just got a floor plan. You haven't designed the walls, the doors, or anything. It's a square building, no windows or anything like that. As you start pulling in these components and systems, the ISIM uh, model it gives you a, a carbon rating for what you're doing. And the idea is, if I can demonstrate it, uh, to start with, where it's just a, a, a box, the carbon rating can be anything between really rubbish, red, 
and, and might be quite good, you know, greenish. Uh, the idea is to become more certain about that rating as you load in more detail, but also to move it upwards into the green zone. So it allows designers to do that uh, and work with it. Um, we presented this at the EcoBuild exhibition, I think it was in May, uh, in, uh, seems a long time ago, but I think it was May, in London, and there are YouTube uh, videos of the presentation. Um, but if you fail to get hold of those, just contact me uh, and, or, or just Google the ISIM. So that was, that was our latest uh, technology strategy board project. We've got another, fingers crossed, got another couple of bids in with them at the moment with, with other. Um, I think you can just kind of, you just about see the, some of the collaborators in, in there. Um, okay, so that was research. What about education and training, which is kind of what I'm here to discuss anyway. So moving on to that. Um, that bit is, is easier. It, it, we're not being terribly systematic about it, but we're being responsive. And as people are asking us, we're doing demonstrations, either open or closed, you know, for particular companies. Um, we're doing professional um, events. It's not the only one, but it's the most recent one, and Alan referred to it uh, earlier. Uh, and we're doing uh, things on specific topics Association for Project Safety. I think this is one of the <coughs> sort of seductive things about BIM is there's something for everyone in it. So safety, uh, something to the major project association I did, uh, something on planning I'm going to do uh, next month. Um, we, this was wonderful. We took part as a team in the Build London Live event, um, which is an online competition, and we won the category of BIM and not interoperability. Uh, so again, you can, you can click onto that or search that and see what, what that's all about. Oh, right, okay, yeah. Um, in terms of education, and a bit more systematic, uh, where's our involvement? Well, we're involved with something that's not very formalized, but it's a group of us who, it was uh, Salford and ourselves, uh, for, very friend at Salford, who's now moved to Leeds, met um, Farzad Khosrowshahi, and, and we, we started this off, and, and it's a growing number of, of uh, British universities uh, joining in, so that's Salford, Leeds Met, Robert Gordon, Aberdeen, University of West of England, South Bank University of London, Loughborough, and, and the list goes on now. So we're talking about, you know, in the spirit of the integration and collaboration that BIM needs to have or could bring. We're talking about universities collaborating. That's why I'm particularly delighted to be here and we'll, we'll, be, we'll be talking to DIT, I hope, about, um, and, and other Irish universities about that. The thing that, that, one of the things that the government's done, and I'll come to government stuff in a minute, is, is to launch, it's been a bit of a you know, slow launch, 11 regional BIM hubs the idea is let's get the economy, or let's get the construction economy bimmed up. And so uh, the Construction Industry Council, I don't think they knew it at the time, but they were earmarked to launch those 11 BIM hubs. So we're part of the Northeast region, uh, but I'm talking to the others in the Northern region, you know, colleagues at Salford and so forth. Uh, and then our own take on education, undergraduate, postgraduate, and postgraduate research um, what I discovered, I did some work, um, just a sort of mapping uh, thing for the Cabinet Office of uh, UK Government, and I, what I hadn't realised is how much uh, BIM-related stuff there already is in our undergraduate programmes. I was, I was really quite pleased about it, you know, because I thought, yeah, there'll be a bit here and there. But it's not been systematically top-down enforced. But because a lot of those people you saw in the picture are fairly young academics, they're really keen on it, and they're putting it into their courses, whatever. So, you know, be they quant surveyors, architects, whatever, they're, they're, they're putting it in there. We've got nothing at this level, but we're uh, developing something at the moment, the MSc, basically. Um, we're doing something from September onwards, and we've got about five or six postgraduate research students who are doing... Um, information, BIM, basically, building information related uh, topics, soft to hard, really, 
you know, a process to technology. So we're moving on that. Bit, I thought I'd be disappointed, but I was really pleased with how much has come in anyway at undergraduate level. Um, the UK government um, it, it has been really pushy about BIM, and good, good for them. Um, it's been operating in other countries, as, uh, as, as many of you know, from, for, a, for a very long time. At Finland, for example, where there's a professor at Salford, Arto Kiviniemi, who said, well, we've had it for ages, but we never had anything like this, where the government's really pushing it um, throughout, the, throughout the industry. So they've been very good. Uh, David Philp was here uh, a few weeks ago, I believe, or uh, pre previously. Uh, and he's one of the leaders of uh, the Cabinet Office or Department of BIS um, task forces. So he's appearing in all these magazines all the time. Um, and the, the, the rollout of BIM in industry, apparently he uh, stood up the other day, Alan was telling me, and Steve told me as well, and said, in the UK, we're going to have to train 4 million people in BIM by 2016. You know, wow. <laughs> okay, well, we can do four, but, you know, the other, yeah, not don't about the million. So it's, it's a really big thing, and it's being backed by these organizations in the UK. So w let's come to the second part now. How do we get it into our education and training system? Now, this is a lovely-looking model that um, some, a member of this BIM Academic Forum, remember that one, that was the universities coming together fairly loosely, uh, has put together... And um, th this is probably the interesting bit for you, all these academic levels and so forth and research. And these are the professional bodies that should be involved in that. So let's just look at this a little bit more detail. Uh, and what they've done with this is to, is to take all the, if you like, the, the roles so turning my head on one side there, you know, we've got construction manager there, I can see that. We've got quant surveyor, and there may be more. This is, this is work in progress. And, and to have a shot at the sort of things that we should be doing with them, ranging from strategic, so the people who are at the top of their businesses, and there are many of you here, but, you know, uh, very busy, short concentration spans, we'll give them three hours, you know, three hours on BIM. What is it? Why are you doing it? How do, you, how do you need to implement it? The, the management people, the people who are running projects, let's say, that might be a, a longer kind of CPD, maybe three-day uh, three courses on, on getting them going. Whereas the people who are actually using it, operating, well, that's, that's continuous. And, and in fact, many of the, uh, the, the, the software vendors will be running these, sort, and others, uh, uh, we'll be running these courses to continuously update these people. Um, these, these slides will all, all be available incidentally. One question that I will ask ahead of the three that Alan mentioned is what, what, what my colleagues are doing with this diagram is equipping graduates with the knowledge of how the industry already operates. Um, this is what we've always done. These, these, these individual silos, boxes, whatever, that's how it already operates. Is that the right way? Is, in fact, BIM going to give us opportunities or, or forces to operate in a different way? So what we're doing, we're, we're mapping things that you need to know against people who need to know them. Now, I think that this bit may well be wrong, and there may well be changes in here. And we're not really addressing them with this sort of diagram, but that's just a thought that came to me as I was sort of helping to put it together and so forth. So, um, what do we actually need to do? Um, well, what I've done with this slide, and it's a, bit, it's a bit busy and everything, but you'll have the slides later so you can have a look at it, is to try and say, well, at a CPD professional level, uh, perhaps this is what we need to do. I mentioned the strategic. These are the MDs, CEOs, etc. Um, what BIM is, many will need to know that. Wh wh why is it important? Why, do you, why might you want to use it? And how do you go about it very quickly? The management level, I've said, for example, three-day CPD to get people started. And these are the sort of things we've got in mind. This is, this is evolving. Uh, and this is work that uh, Adam Matthews, who's Dave, Philp colleague, Dave Philp's colleague, 
in uh, become, seconded to Cabinet Office. This is what he's trying to turn out for government at the moment, what's necessary. How many of these four million need to go through each of these levels? Oh my God. Um, so, okay. Then we go on to the operational level, and I said this should be continuing. In terms of uh, graduates, um, years one to four perhaps, um, this is our typical thing with a, three, with a year three sandwich and where they may get some experience. And year four, so skills in year one, skills and applications in year two, applications and project working, interdisciplinary projects, that's at the heart of it and so forth. Postgraduate, um, there'll be taught modules, dissertation, uh, and of course research, a very single issue. Uh, some are technology based, some are process based, some are even socially based. In terms of technician and skills levels, we mustn't forget that. There is a role, get right down to operatives with field operation, RFID technologies. People will be wandering around with BIM models on handhelds. So, and, and it goes into the area of operation and maintenance and FM as well. So all of this is an early go at a matrix of what we have to be uh, giving people. Um, so what should we cover in the sort of BIM applications area? Forgetting the technology for the moment, although that's very important. At different levels, you've got to access the technology. I think the clue lies in, in where people profess the advantages of BIM lie. And I'll not go through that list, partly because uh, uh, I'm running short of time. But these are the areas. So these are, if we need to exploit these, we need to be giving this information to students, practitioners through CPD, etc., and not just the uh, the advantages, but where are some of the barriers to the uptake of BIM? These need to be part of our courses: procurement, contracts, insurance, IP, PI, um, collaboration, interoperability, data security, and integrity, and computing capacity. Uh, all warrant some kind of mention in a proper, structured, systematic uh, BIM course. Um, okay, nearly at the end, Alan. Um, we're basking in the Northeast, and particularly BIM Academy, we're basking in the limelight at the moment, so I'm going to milk it. Uh, because in a recent article in Building Magazine, it was saying how the Northeast of England is, you know, the hot spot for BIM. It won't be for long, I'm sure, but let's milk it while it's here. And that was their headlines. It's BIM up north as opposed to Grim, which is the normal, uh, the normal saying. Um, so that's basically it from me. Thank you very much for your attention. As Alan mentioned, there are three questions that we want you to consider, and over to him whilst he uh, tells you what they are. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. If you show our appreciation for the presentation. <clears throat>